orations by eminent medical professionals. Starting with the keynote address, we have amongst us the director of Tata Memorial Centre, Dr. Rajendra Bhardi. I now request my colleague to welcome sir with the sapling. Dr. Badwe is a surgical oncologist. He was honored by the government of India in 2013 by bestowing on him the Padma Shri, the fourth highest civilian award for his contributions in the field of medicine. Dr. Badwe has also worked in many reputed institutions across the continent. He is an advisor to the government of India, well Breast Health Global Initiative and World Health Organization, and is the head of the Innovation Council for Cancer Research, the government of India program. He received the UICC Research Recovery International Medal and the Sushrit Award by Mumbai Medical Foundation for Outstanding Contributions in Surgery. He underwent training in breast, breast cancer at Royal Marsden Hospital, London. His original research on timing of surgery during the menstrual cycle for the operable breast cancer has changed the treatment planning in England and East Coast of USA. He is on several scientific committees globally. Besides being a reviewer to several international journals, he has 75 publications to his credit. So here is Dr. Rajendra Badwe apprising us of contemporary India problems and solutions in the Tata Memorial Hospital perspective. Thank you for that generous introduction. This is conspiracy, you know, I can't see faces there. I would love to see some first yawns or something. It, it sounds, it, it gives me some indication that I should stop or I should change or do something else. <laughs> okay. Right. I hope this works. It does. Okay. So the purpose of uh, my talking to you today is to give you some perspective uh, about uh, how health in general is looked upon. And uh, my examples would be mainly for cancer because I specialize in cancer, but whatever is applicable in cancer is applicable in all general health related uh, problems. And problems are similar and solutions are also similar. So we are two major statements that begin this uh, year or the year that went by is that all these years we were made to believe that the West is best and we are now made to believe that let's make something in India. So let's have pride in what we do. So let's look at is that justifiable in the model of cancer and how things have been done at Tata Hospital or in general how the things uh, are run. So let's first understand if you believe that there is a problem, if you believe that there is a problem and problem is cancer, then the first step is to gauge the problem. You have to understand how big is the problem, what's the quality of problem, is the problem of one kind, is it similar in the West, it's similar in the neighboring countries. So there is an understanding of the problem, there is a quality of problem and there is a trend in problem. If you understand all these three aspects of the problem, in relation to the geographic epidemiology, West, East, neighbors, ourselves, then you get some insights with which you can find some solutions. So here is the population structure. The population structure tells you that's India, uh, sorry, that's India and that's United States. If you look at cancer as a problem, major problem arises 45, 50 plus. Cancer below that age is very little. When I look at incidences, the incidences are about one third or one fourth in below 50 compared to above 50. So if I were to draw a line at 50 somewhere there in India, we have only 20% and below, less than 20% of our problem that faces major cancer problems. 
The same number in the West, that's somewhere there, is approximately 45%. So under 20% versus more than 45%. We are a young, thriving country. Compared to the West, old hands. A lot of old people there. But that would make a difference in the number of cancers majorly. But we are slowly inching towards it. And let me tell you very frankly, I have heard this that we are inching towards the West for the last 20 years. We have not, we have not got even an inch closer to, that, to what we were about 20 years ago. We are no different. We are, we are just the same. And that's good for cancer. So that's the cancer. 94 per 100,000 per year. 94 cases per 1 lakh population per year is what it stands today in India. And this is what it stood 15 years ago, and for the last 15 years it remains at 94 per 100,000. In the West, it's 318. In UK, it is about 335. In Germany and France, it's almost about 300. So, in all aspects, we are about a third of what the West is. I'm here to wipe out. If you have in your mind, the West is best. So if you still believe that the West is best, look at this again. So three times more cancer in that country compared to us, you might say, that how can you be so confident? How do you know that all cases diagnosed are being detected? Now the answer to that is, the documentation in the United States, when this number was put in, 318, was approximately 25% of the population. And what they did was looking at urban, semi-urban, and rural. There's not much a rural pocket in the United States. But this division, based on the habitat, based on uh, their incomes, and there is a graded reduction in the incidence of cancer. So we have rural cancer registries, we have semi-urban cancer registries, and we have urban cancer registries. If I were to look at some rural cancer registries here, it would be about, it would hover between 40 and 50. 40 and 50 per 100,000, and we have house-to-house -house surveys in approximately 4 million population for the last 20 years, and the incidence has not changed. It's between 40 and 50. In, in say, you go about 50 kilometers away in a semi-urban habitat, the number rises to about 60 to 70. And you come to Mumbai, 100 to 110. So there is a geographic rise as we go from one place to the other, and it is almost similar, whether it is Mumbai, Delhi, Kolkata, uh, Bangalore, Chennai, name the metropolitan area, and it's about 100. So all put together, we hover between 80 and 90. That's the number that we have. And the incidence in rural pocket is extremely low. We are not missing out. We are doing house-to-house -house survey to find out whether there is cancer, and it just doesn't exist. So what kind of cancer? So kind of problem. I mentioned to you that we will gauge the problem by its magnitude, by what kind of problem and its trend. Look at these bars. I am so happy looking at the heights of these bars, you know, for, for India. Um, that's the kind of problem. 11, lung cancer. The same lung cancer is 44 there. Look at prostate. Prostate doesn't feature here. Prostate cancer in India is about 3 or 4 per 100,000. And the number there is 98. You know the reason? The reason is very simple. They do a lot more PSAs and pick up cancers. Cancers which will never be, never surface in the individual's lifetime. But it's a good opportunity for somebody, for a surgeon to do a surgery. Good opportunity for a robotic system to be used. Isn't it? So, what they have done is finesse with which you can look at an abnormality called cancer under microscope. But is that a killer cancer? So, if I were to look at, you must have traveled by air many times, that little metal detector at the airport, look at that metal detector. For a moment, change that detector's ability. Instead of detecting metal, if it were to detect past or present, corrupt thought in your mind. <laughs> I will not be able to walk through. <laughs> and I wonder how many will walk through it. So, we would detect a huge number of corrupt people. Isn't it? But that's not what we are looking at. 
We are looking at a terrorist. Can a terrorist walk through it and pick up a gun and fire at everybody? We are looking for cancer that can kill. We are not looking at innocuous diagnosis under a microscope. That is creating business. I will come to that model a bit later. Suffice to say that the commonest cancer there is the least common cancer in India. The same thing holds true for breast cancer uh, in India versus there. That's women, the same thing, breast 25, breast 92, and there are many other cancers which are very, very unusual. So we are much better. For a change, we need not say West is best. India is the best place. Now, what are the trends? This is a difficult slide to read, but I don't want to read anything here. Look at graph 1, graph 2, graph 3, graph 4, graph 5. All of them, the solid line is rising and the dotted line is going down. It will cross somewhere, it might have crossed earlier. Whether it is Mumbai, Delhi, Chennai, Bangalore, Bhopal, all these places. Breast cancer is on the rise and cervical cancer is on the wane. So, do we have any screening for cervical cancer? Do we uh, give some vaccines? Uh, or is there something else that is happening? Or we have our own cures for prevention of cervical cancer. We are not doing anything. But the cervical cancer is reducing at a breakneck speed. And the only reason the places where cervical cancer is reduced is places where municipal corporations have come up, places where running water and privacy of bathroom has come up, and males are keeping themselves clean. Imagine in rural pocket. What's the rural pocket? That's Barshi. Cervical cancer, almost a straight line. Breast cancer, almost a straight line. And cervical cancer remains 30, 35. In Mumbai, it was 35. Today, it stands at 10. And the best figure in the West is 5, 4. So how far are we from there? And you might just say that, how do you know something else is changing? And that's something else. If I go to this rural pocket in Barshi and look at our Muslim brethren, what are they doing? They have circumcision at birth, which guarantees cleanliness, hygiene of the genital parts from birth. The incidence of cervical cancer in these Muslim brethren across India, Barshi is no exception, is 4 per 100,000. Same thing as it is in the West. So we just thought, let's look at and talk to our people, our neighbors in the Middle East. Do they use vaccine uh, for cervical cancer? Surprise, surprise. They say that we don't have that cancer. But we here will not look at it that way. You know, this is a religious thing. You can't follow that. But let there be a cafeteria choice. You decide. You want to keep yourself clean, all the meals, whether they should have cleanliness taught. After phimosis, physiological phimosis gets over, maybe age 9, 10, teach genital hygiene in the schools, or we can have circumcision, or we can use vaccine. Vaccine costs about 2500 rupees. Four vaccines need to be needed to be taken with the guarantee that the antibody titer against HPV will be high and CIN 2 and 3 will be reduced. No evidence as of today that invasive cancer will reduce. Here is an evidence that not just incidence of cancer, invasive cancer, but even deaths related to cervical cancer are less in males, uh, in Muslims. So in general, hygiene, such a simple thing, running water, in some of the some 60 years of independence, we should have running water in every household, such a simple thing to do. Let's look at some other numbers. There will be lots of numbers, and all numbers related to cancer. I'm very fond of numbers. Um, Look at Barshi. Breast cancer, 8 per 100,000. It has remained 8 per 100,000 for the last 20 years. It has remained at 8 per 100,000. Dream figure. Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation visited that place and found that this is a place we should, where we should invest money to understand why breast cancer is so low. So that they can export something from Barshi to the United States. And unfortunately, the person in Barshi wants to know, can he get something imported from the United States? <laughs> so unfortunate. So look at that number. I moved from Barshi rural to Barshi urban, 50 kilometers apart. 8 jacks up to 14. I come to Mumbai, 32 per 100,000. 
look at the geographic distribution, we know why this cancer is at these places. Right. So, the trends tell me that there is a rise in breast, ovary and lung. Lung especially in metropolitan areas because lots of smoking, lots of um, exhaust from uh, automobiles. And cervical cancer and stomach cancer both. And I, did, I, forget to, I forgot to add penile cancer. All these three cancers are dramatically reducing. Especially hygiene, cleanliness, the way we store our food. All that adds up to reduction in the stomach cancer. So that's what it is. And we have extremely low prostate and colorectal cancers. But all cancers put together has been a straight line. It has not risen for 20 years. And we are the only country in the world that has a straight line as far as cancer is concerned. BRIC countries are on the rise as far as economics is concerned. And if I get rid of the I from that BRIC, all other countries have a rising incidence of cancer because they are blindly following what the West has done, screening. But we ran a study of a more, more than a million women and if you were to have first 15 years of stay outside of metropolitan habitat, then the incidence of breast cancer is low. Such a simple thing to do, isn't it? When I go to these schools to talk about cancer, I sometimes feel like crying. There are such roly-poly children, all of them, huge amount of obesity, and that's going to hit us 10 years, 20 years from now. And surprisingly, before I went on to talk to these children, I was talking to some of the mothers outside, there was not a single mother who was not complaining that the child is not eating. I wonder where does this obesity come from? The child is not eating it, and yet, perfect round ball. Okay, so we are, we are much better. A third of what the West is. What can we do about it? Imagine two thirds of this third, two thirds of this third is preventable. 40% of cancers in our tobacco relationship. This is the only product that we give money to buy our debt. This is the only product. And I don't think anything else that we can otherwise do when we are aware that you buy this and you will die. But we do it. We do it routinely. For, uh, for buying vegetables, we would expect the vendor to come to your doorstep and you will walk 20 steps to go and buy your debt. Yeah? Tobacco, alcohol, each of these. Uh, so, if you were to just stop that, a lot of incidents, 40% of the cancers will be wiped off if we take care of tobacco. I was in this uh, place in Gujarat, uh, a, jilha, a district called Kheda, which is the largest producer of tobacco in India. And after a long talk, all those gory pictures, you know, all those kinds of things, there was this old man sitting there, he must be in his early 90s. He said, Ye to hume malum hai. So I said, okay, then why did you stop? Hum jab chote the, tab tamaku compound karke lagaya jata tha. Kyunki insects nahi aate thi. Gai bhais andar nahi aati thi because gai bhais and insect know that it is harmful. But we don't. Isn't it? And he finally said that the compound has now eaten the whole farm. It's only tobacco that is grown. Okay, that's about tobacco. About 10 to 12 percent of cancers in semi-urban and urban India are obesity related. We need to walk. We need to walk, we need to exercise. We need to see that we reduce, we don't gain weight between ages 35 and 50. If we gain weight at that time, there is weight gain after 50, between 50 and 60 naturally for every woman and in man. There are five cancers related to tobacco. There is breast cancer, there is body uterus cancer, there is kidney cancer, large intestine cancer, lower end of the esophagus cancer, diabetes, hypertension, stroke, cardiac ailments, you name the thing and we eat our heart out to affect our heart. We need to do something about it. I remember I used to be taught, uh, my, my grandmother used to make me recite something at bedtime. It is still there in my head, I have not implemented it, unfortunately. At 10 years, stop holding your mom's finger. At 20, stop playing with toys. At 30, 
stop looking around. <laughs> at 40, at 40, reduce night food, reduce dinner. At 50, stop eating outside. Impossible today. Nothing cooked at home. How can you not eat outside? <laughs> At 60, nothing new to be done. At 70, stop sour food for arthritis. At 80, hard bed. At 90, stop having zest for life and at 100, stop your life. 20% of the uh, cancers are related to infection, whether it is stomach, whether it is cervix, whether it is penile cancer, I mentioned that to you earlier. What have we done from the Anna Hospital for tobacco? It's victim's voice. All the victims came together and spoke to various uh, of our politicians and Gutka ban came in. All the, all the chief ministers from about 20 states were sensitized and we have Gutka ban in position. The media helped us a lot in disseminating Gutka. And the reason why Gutka is easily available, marketed, and 75% of tobacco in India is non smoked. It is sold as non smoked tobacco. We need to curtail that. Finally, HC uphold, upholds the ban on Gutka and we don't have those strips, those shining strips right outside this Sion Hospital, Tata Hospital, every educational institute, everywhere. Let us talk to a great extent. So, we, I spoke about our strengths, low lung, moderate breast, and low prostate, and cervical and oral cancer. But what's our problem? What's our weakness? These are the numbers per 100,000 in rural, urban, United States. If you treat them, survival of these is 10%, 40%, 70%. So they are better. But they are better, it should so happen that by the time we improve, to catch up with them and make it 70% here, even these numbers grow to 300. That will be misery. We shouldn't be doing we should do screening. They have followed screening and that's how they have brought down their, their improved survival. But screening adds a lot to the denominator and that denominator when it swells up, you will have survival improvement. I showed you the mortality figures. They are worse than what we are. So, we need to improve upon it with screening. What does screening mean? Screening means that anybody who is ostensibly normal, asymptomatic, walking on the streets of Mumbai should be called. Please come. Do this test. And if you have this test positive, you're likely to have cancer. Let's treat you for that cancer. And the end point of such an intervention should be reduction in mortality. That has not happened in the West. Mortality, when I say mortality, number of dead bodies per 100,000 normal population per year. That has not changed in that country. So that is what we should be doing. How much is the overdiagnosis? Unnecessary diagnosis. How much is that? Reduction in all-cause mortality as well as cause-specific mortality. But unless the second point is satisfied, we should not be implementing it. So let me show you, is it satisfied in some of these common cancers? Lung cancer. There are five, uh, four randomized studies, the fifth one I'll show you after this. And in all of them, the relative risk is that much. When I say 1.03, 1.14, 1.11, 1.13, 3% excess mortality when you screen, 14% excess mortality when you screen, 11% excess mortality in the screen down, 13% excess mortality in the screen down. So you start screening and you'll kill you. Should not be done for lung cancer. That's lung cancer mortality. Look at the lung cancer mortality. That's the number of patients dead, number of individuals dead, and that's the years after randomization. The red is screen population. That is non-screen population. So that's how the difference is. Prostate cancer. Screen population, excess diagnosis. You have more diagnosis. You, you want to pick up more cancers early, but somewhere down the line it should meet. Now we have 20 year follow-up and yet the incidence is about 20, 30, 40 percent more. These individuals are not supposed to die of their disease. Not just die, the cancer is never supposed to manifest itself. But yet, People keep on diagnosing. If they are not supposed to be manifested, they will not die. And if they are not supposed to die, they will live. The reason is that, what am I selling? You, you go through your education. What are you selling? You are selling immortality. You don't want your patients to die. Imagine 
a percentage of individuals who know under microscope have disease, that disease will never manifest in their lives and they will never die. You want to treat only screen population because all your patients will live. They will keep on walking on the streets of Mumbai saying that because he treated, because she treated, I am living. You will be the famous doctor, the best, because your patients don't die. These individuals are comparing themselves with people who die of cancer, whereas in ideal way, they should be comparing themselves with normal individuals without the stamp of cancer. Creating business is not the primary goal of medicine. Breast cancer, below 50, no evidence that it saves lives, mammography. No part of the world, including United States, do not offer breast cancer screening with mammography below 50. It happens in India, metropolitan India. Above 50, 30% 30 reduction, but huge amount of overdiagnosis, approximately 30% overdiagnosis. I'm not going to the details. Pap smear saves lives, but Pap smear costs about $109. We looked at VIA, $9 is the cost. VIA in 75,000 individuals and awareness in another 75,000, we have a 31%, at the end of 12 years of follow-up, 31% reduction in mortality. Today implemented in 17 states, has capability of saving 22,000 women lives every year. Also implemented in four other countries, 78,000 lives saved annually in globally if implemented in, uh, in the rest of the world. Suffice to say that we should not just increase the number diagnosed, we should save lives. If we implement what's the best evidence in our day-to-day -day practice, so look for best evidence and then practice, you will save lots of lives. The kind of medicines that we use, if you see, USA, Argentina, Egypt, India, we are the storehouse of generic medicine. We have the cheapest medicine, so we are best. We are best in India as far as the cheapest medicines are concerned, and they're the best quality medicines at least in metropolitan India. A little bit about research, repurposing. Instead of getting into a new molecule, for a 20% improvement, a 30% improvement, the cost of that medicine is about 15 lakhs of rupees. Can we use something that is already available on the racks, show that it is effective and use it tomorrow. The duration of time safety proven, cost less and we can have exactly similar kind of survivals. What we have done in Tata Hospital is that for years, for years, radioisotopes are used for thyroid disease alone. Why is that? Because it homes onto it. Iodine homes on to thyroid appropriately, it doesn't go anywhere else. We now have targeted therapy, we have rituximab for lymphoma, we have Herceptin for breast cancer. This targetedly goes to the cell. The ability to kill is small, but it goes targeted, it doesn't go anywhere else. Now if I were to tag this antibody with a radioisotope, so the payload on the missile increases, it goes to the place where it is supposed to go, doesn't go anywhere else, and kills the cells better. Rituximab, approximately 1 lakh per month, standard of care today is 9 months of treatment. If I tag it, we are already ready, we have done the first studies, single injection. I use single injection of rituximab, and we do that similarly for Herceptin 2. So, survival after the treatment of cancer should improve uh, in, in various ways. But, look at some biology. Whichever cancer you look at, God has been kinder to women. Women live much better between menarche and menopause. Prior to menarche, post-menopause, their death rates related to cancer are similar to men. But during reproductive age, hugely better. And look at, in, in general, in uh, evolution, for perpetuation of species, it's the woman that is most important. And she has to be preserved. Look at outcomes of septicemia. Much better in women in the reproductive age versus any other time. Is that progesterone? And we ran a study giving progesterone cost 60 rupees for a single injection. Single injection prior to breast cancer surgery, four days prior. And we now have a 30% reduction in deaths related to breast cancer. This drug is used, the label indication is threatened abortion. 
safest drug and can be improved for breast cancer. Lots of hype about it. We use it routinely for majority of breast cancer. Suffice to say, low cost repurposing of drugs is what we should be looking at. In general, before I conclude, I would like to stress on four important points about healthcare. A facility that offers healthcare delivery should serve the whole spectrum of society. I hate to say when a government hospital is looked upon as a poor man's place. No, this wasn't the image 20 years ago. This wasn't the image 25 years ago. We should treat and understand the disease affecting the whole spectrum of society. We should create that atmosphere in every hospital wherein the poor and the rich and who wants to come in middle class, all of them come to the same place because the best of the care is given in that place. Reduction is in delivery and unifying in planning. If I'm doing liver surgery, if I'm doing pancreatic surgery, I can't be doing one surgery in a year. I need to focus, not do any other surgery, come on to that focused area. A reductionist approach wherein the high technology is involved, greater care is involved. You focus and you get up better care. But in planning, as far as the research goes, the same thing is happening in breast, might be happening in colon, might be happening in some other area. So that unifying vision, I would refer you to some of the painters' paintings by Escher, beautiful paintings of counter currents. Have a look at them. In the same picture, some of them are coming down, some of them are going up, and it is so perfectly in unison. In reality, it cannot happen, but it, it appears perfectly in unison. Third, and this is the most important part of it, medicine is not a business, but it needs to be run like one. When I say business, there, I cannot create need. If I'm selling Toyota car, I want everybody in my precinct to have Toyota. If I am a doctor, everybody in the area where I am can't be diseased. The end point of my, ex my existence is zero disease in society. So, we work towards our irrelevance. In Marathi, there is a saying, Garad Saro Vaidya Maro. We are supposed to be irrelevant once our need is over an individual's life. We can't be creating business. We can't be creating anxiety. We can't be creating hype in society. And that's what happens when a celebrity stands up and says that I have had my BRCA tested, I am BRCA positive, and I have had bilateral prophylactic mastectomy. The end result, next day, about hundreds of calls for Tata Hospital, you do BRCA test, am I going to be BRCA positive? BRCA is a gene that is part of inherited breast cancer Inherited breast cancer is only 2% of all breast cancers. And in these 2%, 1% are BRCA positive, half of them. And the rest of the 98% start coming to me saying that why don't you dress for BRCA? This is plain and simple. BRCA is done at 40,000 rupees. Instead of doing one test out of 100, if I were to do 100 tests, how many times bigger business? This is share market philosophy. This is not looking at people's healthiness. And who else? So the company that offers it stands to benefit. Who else stands to benefit? I stand to benefit. I'm a surgeon. I do a lot more prophylactic mastectomies. But let me tell you that the health quotient, the feeling of being healthy is so good in India. I try to randomize patients for a prophylactic drug for prevention of breast cancer. I counseled about 128 women. These women were mothers of individuals who were affected by breast cancer. And I told them, you are at a risk. Please, will you, if you get onto this drug, we'll get to know whether this saves lives or not. Out of 128, two individuals agreed. And I feel really happy about it. Your feeling of healthy is within you. You don't have to pop a tablet every day to feel healthy. So this decision is entirely a personal decision. Nothing wrong in it. There's absolutely nothing wrong in it. If I'm going to wake up every morning with the feeling that the sport of Democrat is going to fall today, am I going to get breast cancer? I better get my breast out. Because the quality of life is affected. But that has nothing to do with curing her problem of BRCA, which remains unaffected, 
curing a problem of breast cancer which also remains unaffected. Thank you very much. Are there questions after the keynote or? Thank you. Thank you for the insightful lecture, sir. I'd like to call upon our dean, Dr. Sulaiman Merchant, sir, to give sir, Dr. Kubarwe a token of our gratitude. Well, then I'd like to say a few words more about Dr. Rajan Bhadwe. He's been a very good friend as a Swati Pranabhal Gusri Abhinash Shupe. We're all batchmates. And Rajan has done a lot more than what he's shown here. And I'm, I'm sure he could not accommodate all of that at this time. But one particular initiative, besides, of course, all the great things he's shown, is the focus on improving healthcare via training people to do onco work at other hospitals. Initially, it was in Maharashtra. I don't know the numbers now, but I think there are quite a few. Rajan, how many are there in Maharashtra? And that's right. So 11 in Maharashtra and 56 hospitals in the country have been trained through Tata Memorial. I think there can be no better service to Onco Care than this. Uh, this man's vision, this man's dedication, and uh, the entire team, of course. If anybody wants to see the vision of Dr. Rajan Badwe, please compare old pictures of Tata Memorial Hospital along with the new one with the new building added. And I'd like all of us to take a little bit of time off, visit Tata Hospital and see the dedication of the doctors there. I'm sure we have wonderful people everywhere. But morning to evening, continuously seeing hundreds and thousands of patients and still managing a smile at the end of the day. So there's a lot about Tata culture. So hats off to the Tata culture and hats off to Dr. Rajan Badu. We will be starting with the inauguration ceremony shortly. 